works. Okay, please. Okay, so let me share my screen. Oh, I don't have permissions. You should have the permission, okay? Yep, I do now, okay. Okay, so first, let's just quickly review what you should have from last class. So last class, we did the Docker and Node setup. So by now, what you should have is you should have Docker desktop installed in an account, and you should be able to be uh, to see this screen, something like this. Um, Node should work on your device, and um, you should have some sort of IDE to edit uh, the JavaScript code. As long as you have that, this should be fine. Um, so I would encourage following along, at least for the first half of this lesson, um, because it should be relatively simple. The second half will take a little bit of creativity. So that's your homework, essentially. So OK, what we're going to do is we're going to create a website using Node.js um, and be able to run it on Docker. So first, um, if you remember from last week, we ran this code at the very end uh, in order to create a website that returned hello world whenever you accessed it. So I'm going to paste it into the ID. Um, and we're going to explain what this does, because um, I think it's important that we know what our code is doing. So first, const HTTP equals require HTTP. In Node.js, the require keyword is just essentially like the import keyword that you would see in other languages like um, Python or Java. I should, I'll, I'll paste this in the chat so you guys can uh, access it, hopefully. So, and then we just have variables for the host name and port. And then the important part is here, which is where we create the server. Uh, so we use HTTP and we create a server with request and um, response. And every time the uh, every time someone tries an access your server, which is, for example, if you're creating a website, them trying to view your web page would be like an HTTP request. They will send the request and then you will respond. So what we did last week is we responded with the status code 200. 200 is the status code for OK, which means everything is going fine. And then we set the header for plain text, and then we outputted hello world. Um, and then that would lead to the, the website that we saw last week, which was just a website that would return hello world no matter what. And you can see this is because the request is never being checked, right? So no matter what request they give, it will always just output hello world. So um, let's let's try this. Um, what is it called? Server.js. So if we try and go to localhost, you can see it outputs uh, just hello world. So um additionally i think it's easier just for testing purposes to use just the node command in your uh command prompt um because it is a little bit of a hassle to set up docker every single time so i would save that for when you have like at least roughly finalized what you're doing um but you can see that no matter what address we visit we can visit like test it all out the same thing okay so now we're going to learn how to handle multiple pages. So what that means is if you go to say like Wikipedia, you can see that if we visit, um, let's say we visit this one, uh, Jim Lovell, you can see that there's stuff after the domain name, right? And this is what we're going to learn is how to handle requests to different pages. So um, we're going to use the request keyword and you can see uh, what, what we can check is we can check if request.url and the URL will be everything after that slash. So 
in the case of the website we just saw, it would be um, it would be this, which is slash wiki slash gym mobile. It would be this. So now what we can do is we can check if the request.url is equal to, let's say it's just a slash, which means we're visiting like the home page. Then we're going to write hello world. And then we can create, let's say, a test where if it visits um, the test uh, URL, it'll output, let's just say, test page, right? So if we try this, and then we can run this. And then also, um, we're going to start using the right head command um, instead of the what we did earlier with uh, with set header and status code, it just combines them both into one. So it makes your life a little easier. Um, so we can see it, right head just sets the status code at the beginning and then it sets the headers um, and you can have multiple of them. So you can do like comma and then set more headers. Uh, but for now, we, we're only gonna deal with the content type. So we don't have to worry about that. So now if we try and run this and we go to our local, we can see that when we visit the test page specifically, it'll output test page. If we visit our home page, it'll output hello world. And you can see if we visit any other page, let's say page A, you can see it doesn't load. And that's because in our if statement, we don't have we don't have anything handling a different case. So it won't return anything. And as a result, it will load forever and it won't return anything. Um, I believe it'll throw some kind of error if you wait long enough. Um, so let's try and handle that. So what we have here is we have, we're going to handle the else case. And what we're going to do is if it's not one of these two pages, we are going to write 404. So just as 200 was the code for okay, 404 is the code for not found. So now if we try and run this, um, we can see that, let's just, did I not save it? I didn't save it. Okay. Now, if we try and run this, you can see it will output HTTP, HTTP error 404, and it'll output whatever error web page that your browser uh, throws. So I'm running Google Chrome, so this is the default web page for an error for Google Chrome. Um, and you can see it still works if we go back to any of other pages, right? Okay. Um, so yeah, this is just an example. So now, while this looks fine, uh, we'd rather have a web page that actually like looks a little prettier than just plain text. So we're gonna learn how to put HTML inside of this. So if we go back here to our code, we can see that we're explicitly saying content type is text slash plain, right? So instead of plain text, if we want HTML, we can specify that it's specifically HTML text. And then um, now that we have HTML text, we can output any format of HTML. So we can make a header like this. I think you guys have learned some HTML, right? I believe so. Um, this should be pretty familiar. So this is just a header. And then if we run this and we go to our test page, you can see now it's nice and big. So you can uh, input any HTML you want in here um, and it will hopefully work. However, if you're actually building a web page, it's not particularly, you know, nice to paste all of your HTML into this function. And then if you have multiple pages, you have to paste all the HTML into all the functions. You know, that's just really messy and hard to edit and keep track of. So what we're going to do is now we're going to handle the um, accessing of files. So importing from a file, this requires you to, um, again, require FS, which is file system, this is just a default Node.js um, way of handling files. Again, remember that it's the require keyword. It's not import or anything like that. So const fs equals to require fs. 
and then um, now yeah, the syntax is just this. So it's fs.read file and then the link to your file. So if we go to um, we go to our file explorer, we can see that we have a wikipedia.html here in the same um, directory as our running JavaScript file, which is the server one. So all we have to do is just do um, here. We just we can access it directly with wikipedia.html. Um, if it was in a folder, so let's say we want to access this HTML folder, um, let's say 44.html, we would have to do slash HTML and then slash the name of our file. Um, and then we have to give it a function on what, you know, what it should do with our file. So it'll catch an error and it'll output our file. Um, I believe this file is a special object. Um, it's not like a string. I believe it's a special object, but the response works and uh, regardless. So it's, it's pretty nice. So what we're going to do is we're going to say, if there's an error, then we're going to return our uh, 404 not found, right? And if there's not an error, then we're going to return our file as an HTML file, right? So remember the, the content type should be HTML. So if we copy this into our code here, into our test, and then run this, it should out output uh, something. So now you can see it actually, it loads the Wikipedia page. So you can test this pretty easily. Uh, if you're on Windows, what you can do is you can say you can search Wikipedia. If you do Alt, left Alt, and then left click, it'll download the file as for you as um, as an HTML file. So you can do this for anything. So what else? Let's say Microsoft. You can download this and. Uh, you run this, it'll, uh, if you open this file, it should open whatever page, um, whatever page it is as we, as a HTML file. Although yeah, it's lagging a bit. So I'm just gonna close it and reopen it. But um, that is that is how, how, how it works. So this is for easy testing, just left alt and then left click and you can download any page. So I did that before this lesson with Wikipedia and you can see it besides a couple of like, you know, JavaScript components that weren't really downloaded correctly. Otherwise this, this page runs normally. Um, okay, so this is nice. And now we can edit the HTML separately in our HTML file instead of having to, you know, paste everything inside our uh, JavaScript file. So I believe, yeah, we can edit. If I, I recommend Visual Studio Code, um, you can use any ID you wish, but with Visual Studio Code, you can also just edit HTML as well. So it's very easy. And you can see their shell file is very long, but um, yeah, it's it's it makes it very easy to edit any any language. Okay, um, so now let's try adding CSS. So the way that the um, that the HTML requests work, so we should probably explain how the HTML requests work. So what this does is when you go to wikipedia.org, what you do is you send a request for their HTML um, so that you can display it and you send a request to wikipedia.org and then they will return the HTML file if you press F12, you should be able to open that HTML file and you can see in the head, there should be, I believe there should be a style. Yeah, okay. So they've, they have pasted all of their style into, into the head of, of the sheet. Um, I believe it looks like it, yeah. But um, alternatively, what you can do is you can 
uh, write your CSS in a different file. And what it will look like is you'll have a link to that file. However, because you've only returned the HTML and not the CSS, the browser won't know how to display the CSS yet, right? Because it's in a different file. So what it'll do is it'll read the file and it'll send back another HTTP request to your web server and ask for the CSS. And then you should be able to handle that and return that back. So um, yeah, so for example, one, one common way to add an external CSS file to HTML is to do link um, rel equals style sheet and then href is uh, the address of your CSS. So whatever it's stored as. So what it'll do is it will, it will send another request to your server asking for this file. Um, and luckily it is just an HTTP request, the same as our HTML requests. And we can handle this for the exact same way. So when they ask for wikipedia.css, uh, we can just, um, we can just handle it like usual. So I don't have a CSS file for this Wikipedia page, but they will, um, they will ask for slash, for example, slash wikipedia.css. And then you can handle that as usual with your if statements. It, um, so it should be pretty simple. And um, and yes, obviously you do have to change the content type if you plan on writing CSS back. Okay, so we're gonna do this all together now. So we're gonna combine everything. So likely you'll have something like if your request URL is your page, your HTML page, and it'll return whatever HTML. And then your, if your request URL is a CSS page, it'll return whatever CSS and should be all be fine. However, the problem with this, generally speaking, is that if you have a web page with multiple, you know, multiple pages and multiple HTMLs and CSSs and whatever, you will have a very, very long if else chain, which is not just, it's not easy to edit. and it's very messy and it's just it's it's not good um uh it's better to have like cleaner code so what we're going to do is we are going to optimize this a little bit and um i will show you how to optimize that in just a little bit so first you have to actually create a set of html and css files so um an easy way is just use some sort of online editor i've given you this one um but you can really use anything um as long as it has an option to output as an html like as a folder containing html css etc so this is just one ex uh, one that i found that seems to work pretty well um so this is going to be your homework is first to go on to one of these websites it doesn't have to be fancy it doesn't have to be really good but just create some website that has multiple pages and then download it um, when you download it it will likely be in a folder like this and it will contain HTML documents, CSS documents. And then if you did it from this website, it will have JavaScript documents as well. Um, if you did it from some other website or if you just wrote them by hand, you may or may not have JavaScript documents. I don't know, not super sure. Um, so now you'd have this folder containing these files, and then we're going to collect and sort these files instead of having you know a massively long if else chain. So first, uh, again, for organizational purposes, I've stored all, everything outputted by that um, by that website into an HTML folder. And then now we can handle this in the code. So this is our final product. I'm going to delete this. And uh, this is our final product, which is here. So what we have here is we have stored an array of all of our HTML pages. So uh, with their um, addresses, home.html, and then I've created uh, other pages as well, and then the CSS pages, and then the JavaScript ones. And then now it's very easy. So you can do if your pages includes the URL being requested, then um, it will read the file from the HTML document, and it will output it as an HTML file. Otherwise, if it's a CSS, so I'll put a CSS with a JavaScript. I'll put a JavaScript. Very simple. Um, yeah, and this code is also all available on the slides. So if you run this, um, 
it should hopefully load your page. Um, so let me edit this just a little bit. Yeah. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove this part and this part for now. We will re revisit this in a bit. Um, so if I run this and I go to localhost800.home.html, I've created this website um, with some like stars and astronomy stuff. And, um, and you can see that the HTML, JavaScript and whatever, it all loads perfectly fine. Um, and the formatting uh, is good. So this is what you should have at this point. After you've created your website and downloaded it, it should work perfectly fine on your own device on this web server, right? So this is what it would look like if someone else was trying to access your website. Um, so this looks very nice. Um, so now the final thing we're going to tackle today is redirects. What that means is, uh, for example, our homepage is called uh, uh, slash home, but generally speaking, you'd want, you know, you'd want the, just the raw URL to direct to home. However, if I enter the raw URL, you can see it doesn't load because I haven't had any condition um, to tackle that, right? I need it to match exactly the URL in here. So one way to do that is to redirect. So what a redirect is, is if you try and access URL A, they will automatically send you to URL B without you needing to even touch anything. Um, so this is very common online with like pretty much any website you visit will probably have some sort of redirects because um, it just allows people to access, you know, web pages without having to perfectly type every single key. Um, so what we're going to do is we are going to do that and uh, luckily for us, it's very simple. So this is this is all of the same format. So all you have to do is you have to write head like usual. And now we are going to learn our third and final code for the day, which is 302. 302 just stands for redirect. And instead of passing a content type, you have to pass a location, which in our case will be home.html. So this is all you have to do is um, write a code 302 and they will automatically redirect it for you. So now if we run it um, and we go to the base page, with, you can see it automatically redirects us to home, right? So this is what we should, um, what we want to look for. And then finally, uh, we're going to handle the 404 case the same way. So previously we handled the 404 case just by returning a 404, right? And it would output whatever uh, Google Chrome's default 404 page is. But what if you want your own 404 page, right? Oftentimes that's that's very useful to have your own page um, because that way you can have your own designs and you can have your links on it um, instead of relying on the default. So the same way we are going to redirect you, we're gonna redirect any URL that doesn't match to the 404 page specifically. So now if we try and run this, and we try and go to something that doesn't exist, let's say slash test, it will redirect us to our full fair page. Um, obviously you can customize this one as well. I I didn't, but you can. Um, okay, so yeah, this should be it. Um, so your homework is to reach this point. So your homework is to create a website that A, is original and unique. So again, I mean, I'm not, I'm no graphic designer, so it doesn't have to look perfect. You know, I just so something like this extra points if you do make it look good, but I just, the point is it's not a graphic design class. It's to make sure that you understand how the node works. So have a website like this and it must have the functionality that we went through. So first you must have multiple pages, right? You must be able to access multiple pages. Um, you must be able to handle both HTML and CSS requests. Um, and then you must have a redirect somewhere. So in our case, I think the easiest way to do a redirect is A, the home page, and B, the 404 page. And then you must be able to run on a Docker. Uh, we'll do that in a second, but uh, there's nothing special we need to do to get this run on Docker. Um, and then finally, if you have 
time you can choose to do something special. So you can investigate and explore other HTTP codes. So today we've only learned 200, which is the OK code, 404, which is the not found code, and 302, which is the redirect code. So if we go to HTTP codes and um, we we'll click on uh, look on the status list, there's a lot of them, right? And some of these are more useful than others, but generally speaking, um, there's a lot of them. So you can try and see if um, you can incorporate any of these. So a lot of these probably don't make any sense. Uh, so like, let's see, like use proxy. Like, I don't know what that means. You probably don't know what that means, but uh, an easy one is like, let's say um, unauthorized, for example, you can, you can try and put that in. Um, it, obviously, without a proper authorization system, it's not going to be really used properly. But you can you can simulate that or, or like forbidden. Um, same thing. Um, so yeah, you can try and explore these and and try and incorporate them if you want to. Uh, but besides that, um, all you need is is just something that looks like this, right? Um, it should be relatively simple, and then. Um, so what was I going to say? Oh yeah. So one thing I think is, is very useful to know is just general debugging. So in JavaScript, the, the way to print to console is, is console.log. So if you know Java, this would be system.println. In Python, this would be print. Um, in C, I believe it's C out. So this is, it's, this is what it is in JavaScript. And then, um, I, I would suggest putting the console.log here in the else statement. So what this means is that if you've messed up coding this somehow, or you put your files in the wrong place, like you didn't put them in the right folder, or like, you know, you, you coded something wrong, likely everything will drop to the else statement and you can see exactly what pages are being accessed by the computer. So let's just say, let's give an example. Let's say that your, let's say my 404 page, um, or no, let's say my home page is not placed in that folder. So what that means is they'll try and access home.html. Um, they'll try and access home.html, but they won't be able to find it in that folder. So if we, why is it not? Okay. Uh, so if we try and access the home page now, you can see it, it loads and it doesn't output anything. Um, but we can see in our log, uh, oh, it's, oops, let's say, okay, let's say we didn't include this. This will drop to the else because it's not going to detect it in our pages. Um, and we can see that, we can see that it was trying to access home.html and now you can, you know, explore your, you can try and debug this, but this is, it's just very helpful to know. Um, you know, where things have, have gone wrong. So um, knowing where and when to put these console.logs is very important. Uh, I will leave it up to you to know, to figure that out. But yeah, it should be, um, it's, it's a good skill to learn. Okay. So finally, uh, finally, if we go back to uh, from here, we can finally put this into Docker. So we can build it. And then we can run it. Docker run. And then we can close this and we can see that if we go back to our Docker, we can see the one we just created. Um, and we can start it if we wish. And then now we can visit our page and it'll work. So yes, this is your homework is to get it working on Docker as well. So um, yeah. And then finally, just a side note, I put this code it's not not just on the slides, but I've also put it on GitHub. So it's at the end of the slides if you click on here. Um, everything in my folder here is on GitHub. So 
you can access it and cop and look at it and whatever whatever you wish to get out of it. Okay, uh, that should be it. Any questions? Thank you, Kathy. So uh, because we have several new students for this team, I think we have students at all different background. So, uh, so I just post a schedule for our team meeting in the chat. So we're still gonna have class on next week. And Kathy, because the team going to perform on April 8th, so we don't have any um, meeting on April 8th. So that means the homework is due on April 15th because we have the, because you said homework due for two weeks, right? But we don't have class on April 8th. I just want you to know, okay? Okay. So uh, Jerry, do you have anything you want the team to know since you're going to be the teacher assistant, you're going to grade the assignment? Where's Jerry? Jerry's gone. <laughs> okay. Oh, Jerry told me because he, he had to leave for another meeting. Okay, so um, because this is the first, uh, because last week, Kathy talked about Docker, right? Because this is really for the preparation. So this week, this is the first tutorial on the real programming. So I'm pretty sure students are going to have questions. So any questions for Kathy? Okay, I'm going to, uh, usually I'm not going to do this, but I just want to make sure, you, you know, you do understand that everything taught by Kathy is fine with you. So maybe let's, I will ask each of you one by one. Okay. So Kathy, do you have any questions for Kathy? Any doubts, any questions? No. I hope you have one question, you know, even just, okay, anything. Because I think Kathy need to know how he's teaching. He need to get feedback from the team. So Kathy, any particular question, any question for Kathy? Yeah, I have the question. Oh, Sophia, you have a question? Okay, go ahead, Sophia. Right. Um, when when I try to download Docker um, and open the file, it says that like the file is corrupt. Um, and I don't know why. Um, are you on Windows? No, I'm on like a MacBook. Okay. Uh, I would say first just try re-downloading it because it's possible you were interrupted like you're, you had network issues or something while you're downloading it. Um, but if it doesn't work, maybe try downloading like an older version. So we go to Mac, let's see. Um, where is the list of, oh, oh, it's, it's here. Okay. So yeah, um, I would say just try re-downloading it and then if it doesn't work, um, it's release notes. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's there's multiple past versions. So maybe the current version doesn't really work on your um, on your device. So maybe down, try downloading a past version. If it still doesn't work, you can email me. But yeah. Uh, uh, how about the first. next week, April 1st, after Kathy finish her lecture, let's have a lab session because we have one hour class anyway, right? So 30 minutes for Kathy's tutorial and 30 minutes uh, for a lab session. So any any people have questions can ask Kathy. So Julie also had the same problem. That's strange. Do you want to share your screen with Kathy? You can show what kind of errors you received. Here it says, uh, also just make sure that you're downloading because it appears there's two ones for Mac. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe, I think I have a MacBook, like MacBook Air. I think it has like a M, it's called like M1 or M2 chip or something. I believe that's an Apple chip, but you uh, might also have an Intel chip. Yeah. So I, I don't know if this actually matters, but make sure you download the right one. Yeah, at least. because usually if you have anything like that, it's a pretty basic error. It has to be something that was not downloaded correctly. So Google on the internet to see whether you have in, Intel chip or Apple chip. There's a way for you to find out which chip you're doing, okay? Yeah, and then also, this is also an option. So the install interactively is, is the setup file, but you can also install from the command line. Mm -hmm. So reading this, this is it's a little more complicated, but it's it's also a good practice just to get used to the command line because the command line knowing how to work it is very important. 
Anybody else like Sophie and Julie experience similar problem? So any student actually installed Docker and downloaded Docker successfully. Can you raise your hand? I don't know how many of you, you actually try to do this. So Abby, Abby, could you share your experience? What kind of laptop do you have? Are you using Windows or a MacBook? Um, I also have a MacBook, but okay. I also ran into another issue. Um, can I share my screen? Of course. Okay. Um, so when I tried to do it, it says like I got to the part where you have the txt file, but like without the txt part, and I think it can't open my file. So I'm wondering if like this is the right kind of like file type that I'm trying to open with my terminal. Um, is it in the right directory? So did you create a no Docker folder to store your server yeah, file? Yeah, I think so. So, like, I have my folder here, and then I have my Docker file. But, hmm. um, okay. Mm -hmm. Then in that week, have the I propose next Saturday. Let's have the we don't teach anything new. So next Saturday, let's have a one hour lab session. I think let's start okay, lower. Sure. Okay, because for you, everything is, because what you teach actually pretty advanced. So I do, I don't want to give student pressure. So let's do this slowly at the beginning. Okay, so Abby, please continue. Oh yeah, I'm just um wondering how to like. Can I see your command line again? Can I see the error that happens? Uh, yeah, I'm saying. Okay. Try running the um the build command. Um oh yeah, yeah, Docker build tag no Docker. Docker build. Okay. No such file or directory. No, no. Uh, click on the name for your file. Make sure there's no like spaces or anything. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah, you, you can close it. I don't think we, I don't think the problem is on the inside. It says, okay, right, well, we can uh, try, just Google the, the error message. I think it's often the most helpful. So just copy and paste the unable to repair context, unable to evaluate sim Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, speaking, well, can yeah. I, can I yeah. interrupt? So what Kathy is demonstrating right now is actually pretty common for computer scientists. So Google for the error message and looking for the solutions. And then Kathy, can we try chat GDP? I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of solutions provided by chat GDP. Mm, I, I've never Google? worked with chat GDP, so I don't know. <laughs> no, chat GDP is actually, anybody had the chat GDP account? Ivy, do you have a chat GTP account? No? Uh, I don't think so, no. Okay, so can you copy paste the error message into chat? Let me let me check the solution from chat GTP to see any solutions provided by chat GTP. Okay. So I found chat GTP is actually more powerful than Google. This is what I found out. Right. So well, Kathy. Um, Okay. 
So I get the error message from Abby. Mm -hmm. I actually did get the same one, but it was because I, I named it wrong. So hmm. this is strange. I, I see the um, the terminal again, or the the file explorer, like where you have the file stored. Mm -hmm. Okay, your command line does look like it's in the right place, right? Can I see the no. hmm. And then go go file explorer, go back of uh, or is it in just go to your device and then users. Okay. So I type the error message provided by IV to chat GDP, and then I get some suggestions, four suggestions from chat GDP. Can I share my screen? Yeah. Okay. So see, this is what I have here. I found chat GDP is pretty smart. Okay. So make it bigger font. So uh, so I could not install Docker on my MacBook. Here's our message. So I even have a typo, enable. Okay, so this is the thing that the chat GDP asks you to do. So Abby, could you check the first one? Do you really have the this one under your directory? Um. Does my node Docker folder have to be inside? You mean inside your username? Yeah. It just seems like it should be. Okay. Um, okay. So this is what I found out about, about ChatGDP. So you you can you do you go to OpenAI, you register for an account. I found it very helpful. Okay. So the ChatGDP can even help you to generate code. So so that means they actually can help you do the homework. So uh, I'm not going to let, let's now spend more time on this. But so what I'm going to do is uh, so anyway, I'm going to copy paste the solution from ChatGDP, and then I also recommend you register account from ChatGDP and ask for ChatGDP for help. So it's actually, I think the, for this type of things, it actually can do pretty well. Okay, so this is option one in the chat. So this is option two. Okay. And then the third one from ChatGDP is that. I found ChatGDP is actually pretty powerful. Okay, the next one is, is this, okay. And then what you can do is how you can, so basically you go to OpenAI and ask for to, to have account with it. Okay, so, but in either way, next week, Kathy, let's have a lab session with the entire team. Okay, so we can answer specific questions. Then before, before we, uh, So Jaden also had the same issue. Sophia also had the same issue. What happened? So does anybody in our team actually store the Docker successfully, except for Cassie? Can you raise your hand? No? Okay. So Cassie, what is your plan for next week? Um, I mean, I don't actually, I do have a Mac, so I can try and I don't use it, but I can try and see because oh. I don't know how Mac works at all. But I if see. anyone is having, is, uh, having issues on Windows, I, I know because I, I ran into issues as well. But I, okay. I believe I put all the issues I ran into on the slides, but obviously, you know, mm. there's more, more than one issue possible. Okay. Um, but I will, I will 
try and download it on my Mac because I, I have one. I just don't use it. And mm -hmm. for next week, um, yeah, we can try and. Yes. And also, I strongly recommend you use ChatGPT as your assistant to help you debug the problem. I found that this uh, AI assistant is pretty powerful. Okay. Because Kathy will not have time to go through each every error. So if you can get help from the AI assistant first, that'd be great. But in either way, next week, uh, next Saturday, we're going to have a live session. Okay. So Kathy, Jerry, hopefully Baron will be back. We'll uh, work with you together for one hour. Kathy, thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, they're not here, but maybe you could send them a message or I'll send them a message, I guess. Because, I, I mean, as a TA, you could try and see if they could get it downloaded first and then they could help people next week, right? Yes, of course. So, Kathy, can you communicate with Jerry and Bauren about it? Yes. Okay. okay. So, it's, it's about the MacBook, but I, I'm not sure whether Jerry and Bauren has a MacBook, because they need to have a MacBook in order to, to you know, try this. Well, yeah, there, how many people are there? There's nine others. So, how many of you guys use Mac versus Windows? Just curious. Yes, how many of you use MacBook? Could you uh, raise your hand? None. Oh, okay. We have Kasti, and I believe uh, Ivy, Sophia, Erin, four of you. So Erin and Kasti, have you ever tried to install a uh, Docker and Node.js? Um, no, because no. I actually broke my MacBook, and the one I have currently is very old. But I do have a Windows, so I can try again on Windows to see if okay. that would work. So Kasti, did you try to install Docker on the MacBook? Yeah, uh, it worked for me. It worked for you. Did you do anything? Could you, uh, we still have a couple of minutes. Could you uh, demonstrate what you have done quickly? I actually really have to go now, but I, uh -huh. can, I can demonstrate next week if that's fine. Okay, sure. Okay. So sure. the for the students who want to uh, join the interconnect, poetry reading team, please stay. Then for the other students, uh, the class finished for the day. Kathy, thank you so much. I'm going to stop recording.